grateful form this morning. Um, this morning, I want you to think of three things. What is your joy? What is your love? What is your peace? So where do, what to you is your joy at the moment, your love, and your peace? Um, often, you know, we look love, joy, and peace. Some people might say it's a bit cliche, or it's very soppy. Um, my husband and I differ mainly on movies. I love the soppy stuff. He likes the blood and the gore, bringing Vikings every day. We actually can't, I actually can't watch Vikings and he watches it because I'll end up running to a toilet because my stomach just can't tolerate the, so then I put on one of my soppy stories. And so we have a bit of a competition, you know, who can watch each other's iPad more, you know, who's transfixed. Um, but to, to my husband, maybe if you say to Andres, love, joy, and peace, what does that bring you? And he'll say, an adult-only resort. <laughs> no children. Because somehow, when we plan to go on holiday, we always get the family next door. <laughs> we never seem to have peace. So he keeps saying to me, all I want is a bit of peace and love and joy and holiday, and I want an adult-only resort. We've never been there because I always take my children with me on holiday. So somehow, we still have, he still has to get that. But that's a superficial joy. It's not really um, a joy in Jesus. It's just, I think, maybe a dream and a hope that he has. But that got me thinking, because we've just planned a holiday. I went on to, I get these emails from Jetstar, and lo and behold, what happens on Sunday last week, Jetstar sends me an email. You can fly to Hawaii, from Hawaii to Sydney for 189 or 159. So I thought, oh, I have to grab this holiday. So when I was thinking about how much the holiday will bring us joy, I thought to myself, well, let me go and see what the psychologists have to say. So I hit Google, and I found somebody called Dr. Rick Hansen. He's a PhD, he has a PhD, and he's a senior fellow of the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley in New York, and a bestseller. His bestsellers are Buddha's Brain, Handwriting, happiness, just one thing, and mother nurture. So I thought, okay, let me see what he has to say. And what he says about joy is, he's, he says, think this is of joy. You can just flick a kind of switch in your mind and turn directly toward joy. Really, the more experiences of joy that you have had and taken into yourself, the easier this gets. Additionally, try things like saying to yourself, May they be joy and open and receive it. Look for all and call forth quick pulses and rushes of flashes of joy. It's for real. For you, joy may have a spiritual aspect to it, perhaps a joyful sense of something divine. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. He alludes to something divine. I thought, okay, come on, let me Google the next thing about him. So I Googled him again on love. And he says, by love, I mean a wide range, including compassion, support, friendliness, encouragement, appreciation, and cherishing. It can be expressed in simple or subtle ways, such as a call to a friend. That reminds me of those competitions that you have when you can call a friend, you know, when you're having one of those trivia evenings. It made me think of that. More patience with a partner, saying that you liked about a co-worker's idea and, or seeing the being behind the eyes of a stranger passing on the sidewalk. So I thought, oh, that's not really, that's already quite superficial. So I thought, oh, I'll Google him again. And I'll Google him on peace. Lo, he writes quite a long stuff about peace, the longest that he's written about most of his articles. It says, first, while most things continually change, some don't. For example, the fact that things change doesn't change itself. Two plus two will always equal four. The good thing you did this morning or last year will always have happened. Things that don't change are reliable, which feels peaceful. Second, the in while individual waves come and go, the ocean is always ocean. While the contents of the universe are changing, the universe as universe is not. You can get an intu intuition of this by recognizing that you are a local wave in a vast sea of human culture, nature, and the physical universe. Yes, you are changing, but within an unchanging Ill Ill illness. The sense of all this, even if fleeting, can really put you at peace. Thirdly, he says, 
you could have a sense of something transcendental, something eternal, call it God, spirit, the unconditioned, or by no man name at all. Beyond words, this offers the peace that passes understanding. And I include it here because it's meaningful to many people. So again, he loops back to the Bible and to Christianity, and he's not. He's, he's in pa part of a scientific cult. So to me, I thought to myself, okay, I've got the secular. What does the Bible say about love, peace, and joy? It says a lot of things about love, peace, and joy. And when I was thinking about it, the first thing I thought about is how much, what is love, what is joy, what is peace to me, and how much have I really practiced it? How much have I lived it out? And it took me back to 2006. I was a children's pastor at a local Baptist church two days a week. And my previous job when I was a younger lady, before I had children, I was a personal assistant in South Africa and basically um, I looked after four bank directors. They came and I, one of my jobs was to make sure things worked with the four banks and once a month I got bank directors together that sort of listened to what I had to say in a way that they came to the meetings, they were quite scared of me. Um, in that I would say to them, well, if you don't come to the meeting, that means you can't make a decision at that meeting, and then they were all there. So apparently, I had some persuasion over four bank directors in South Africa. And um, one of my ex-bosses uh, called me. She lives in Australia, and she had a high position in Tattersalls, which is a pokies. And she said to me, Melissa, I need you to come and overhaul my whole department. It's not working. Um, I need you to come in and put those processes and policies in that you did so well in South Africa, and I need you to overhaul the administration department. But I need you three days a week. So that meant I was working full time, something I never wanted to do when I had children. And when I got there the first day I signed up, they gave me a gaming license, which gave me the opportunity to go onto any pokies floor and do the one on bandits. So I phoned Andres and I said to him, you won't believe this, I've got a, I've got a gaming license. He said, you're the only pastor with the one with the gaming license, so go, go, go play the one, and the one on bandits on the pokies machines, which I did. I actually had to test pokies machines. That was one of my jobs. So, but in saying that, the reason why I'm telling you that story is that I used to catch a train at 25 past 6 in the morning. Um, I was very good. I got up at 5 to 6, brushed my hair, brushed my teeth, put as minimal makeup on as I could, rushed out the door and got my coffee at the little man at the Elfham station. And I was drinking my coffee and my senior pastor at the time said to me, you have to read Rick Warren's book, uh, A Purpose Driven Life. And I thought, well, yeah, I know quite a bit, but I'll give it a go because look, I know quite a lot. I was a little bit um, boastful and I took this thing a little bit nonchalant and I said, okay, I'll start reading it on the train because I'm falling asleep anyway on the train, so I'll highlight a few things. So I started reading the book, um, A Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. And if you don't know who Rick Warren is, he's a well-known author, he's a pastor of one of the largest churches in America, and he's written many books. And I started reading it because I knew I had to do this, this was part of my homework because I had to report back at the next pastor's meeting on what I had read. And I started reading the book and I thought, oh, you know, good, I've read, I've read the foreword, I'm doing well. I got to the beginning of the book and just one or two sentences, Rick Warren writes that, in all circumstances we have to worship God. And I just closed the book straight right there and then because the Holy Spirit just came over me and said to me, do you worship God? God in every circumstance in your life. And I had to say no, because I was boastful. If things were going wrong, if things went wrong, the first thing what I used to say is, why do you do this to me, Lord? You love that one more than you love me. Why do you give me all the hard things in life? And I reflected on the hard things in life. I'd lost a dad when I was 20. I'd lost my best friend, who was my uncle. He died of an AIDS-related disease at 25. So I'd immigrated. I had done lots of things. Um, 
you know, my brother had bankrupted my husband and I just before we immigrated to Australia. We came to Australia really with no money. God really just gave us money to get here. And so I started, started looking at all the bad things that I had experienced. And on that train ride from Eltham to Flinders, God said to me, you need to worship me in every circumstance. Where is your love? Where is your joy? And where is your peace in me right now? I was exhausted because I went to work every day. I was tired. How do I find joy and love and peace in God when everything is not working okay? And being a mixture of every breed and every race, because I'm South African, if I, tr if I trace my heritage back, I go right back to having Dutch in me, French in me. I think I'm the most volatile person. I get very excited while watching um, games on the TV. Um, you think that I knew everything about the, the, the Bombers footy game, Bombers team because I go crazy when, I, when, I, when we watch the game because we barrack for them. And I know nothing about the game, but I'm so emotional that I get so happy. But at the same time, I can get really angry and really sad in a matter of, I think, I mean, Craig, what is the fastest that a Mercedes can go? Nor to 102 seconds? Yeah, well, I can do it. I can do... I can do naught in a, to a hundred in sadness and happiness and joy and frustration and anger within one second. I can go from being happy Melissa to totally despondent person. I have that in my anatomy. But I need to realize that when that happens, I have to stop and not allow that to happen. So I went back to the Bible that evening when I got home from work. Um, after fetching the children from school, and even that's a battle on its own. I don't know if any mothers have fetched their children from school. You wage a war in the car park. Any school car park is a war. Mothers do not, are not loving coming out of the car park. There's no love, no joy, no peace out of a school car park. There's only one tunnel vision to get out of the car park as fast as you can. And I drive an extremely small car, and I had to defend myself against big four by fours. So I thought to myself that night, I'm going back to the Bible. Um, you know, I'm going to go and see. And I'm not a person that articulates myself very well. I don't have a phenomenal large vocabulary. But I started to write down what gives me joy, love, and peace. And when I did look at it, it was God and Jesus that gave me those three things. Um, I love John Piper. I love him. He's a theologian, American guy, an older man. He's the founder and teacher of DesiringGod.org. Um, I listen to his podcasts, and he's a chancellor of the Bethlehem College and Seminary. Um, he's written many books. And I went and I started studying because I love John Piper and just wanted to know what he said. Um, he says that joy is that overbubbling, wonderful feeling of happiness and contentment. For example, when you meet your baby for the first time, you think you can overcome everything. You hear those, you read those blogs, well, I guess I was, my children were born before blogs, so magazines. You read how these mother, you know, they've got these beautiful radiant faces and all of that, and I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be those, one of those moms, you know, I'm going to beat the sleep, I don't need the sleep. You look at that child, you've got joy. Although my husband couldn't quite find our child in the nursery, my daughter, that I actually had to put a purple bunny in her bassinet because I never had joy because he would be gone a half an hour when I asked him to go fetch our child and he would come back and say, I don't know where she is. In the nursery, go. And in South Africa, um, children were being stolen out of the nurseries. So only parents were allowed to go in the nurseries at that time. So I would go and fetch my daughter. But you know that joy when you hold your baby or your puppy or your kitten in your arms? You think, I've got this joy. Well, look, after three days, I had no joy. Amy was waking me up every four hours, although that's good comparison to other babies. Um, I had no joy. I, I couldn't sleep. I was sore. So where was the joy in that? But she did give me joy when she, get, you know, when she did go to sleep, and she was really a good baby. I had joy. You know, I can't complain to other about other parents. My son gave me much joy when he slept through at seven weeks, 
And he gives, yes, there you go. And he gives me joy because he plays in the band and that. So the joy is there, but it's a superficial joy, you know, it comes and goes. When you have coffee and chocolate, all the joy is not really happy, you know. Um, give me coffee and chocolate any day. That joy is different. But John Piper says our Christian joy has infinite roots. It's sort of embedded in us. Um, it's, not, it's not a feeling. I mean, it's a feeling, but it's not an idea. And it's in our soul. You know, it's inside ourselves. You know, you want to go in and find it. You almost want to dissect yourself, you know, to try and find it. It's in our hearts. It's that root that is stuck in your stomach or in your heart. And it's in there because God is in your soul, in your heart. And Apostle Paul, um, that guy amazes me. You know, he went through the worst possible torture, but he's always smiling. <laughs> the kids in Kids Church are learning about Paul and Silas um, singing in the jail cell. You know, he just had so much joy for God. He just lived joy. He wasn't the nicest, you know, he wasn't the nicest guy all the time, but when he met Jesus, he became full of joy, full of love. And the NIV in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 4 says, I've spoken to you with great frankness. I take pride in you. I'm greatly encouraged in all troubles. My joy knows no bounds. So there's no yardstick, no measuring stick. That's a circle. It has no bounds. It's just ever going. It never finishes. And we know that Paul went through horrific experiences. The Bible tells us what he went through. But he had joy. And he had joy, firstly, because his love for Jesus. Secondly, from the joy in the Holy Spirit. Third, his joy knowing that he belonged to the kingdom of God, that believing his faith in God, knowing Jesus as Lord, being part of the body of believers, and lastly, his total reliance on God. John 15, 11 says, I've told you so that my joy may be in you and that all your joy may be complete. Isn't that great? Complete. Never, you know, there's no end. It's just completely going. Um, has anybody, most people might know who C.S. Lewis is. He wrote the best book in the world, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, my ultimate favorite book. And then he just upped his thing with me. He wrote the Narnia series. I loved it. But he was also a great Christian and a great scholar. And I was reading a bit about C.S. Lewis, and it said he was having a meeting with J.R. Tolkien, who is an author, but also a Catholic. And he said they were going somewhere in a car. And he said, in the beginning of the journey, I didn't believe in God. At the end of the journey, I did. Something happened on that journey. And he writes, um, there are four different types of love. Eros, that romantic love. You know the one that makes you weak, weak at the knees? Um, I, when my husband asked me to go out, I went all weak at the knees. I think he went weaker than me. Um, but it's that lovely, that when you touch your boyfriend or your wife or your husband's hands or you kiss them and you still get that tingly feeling, um, it's really great. Um, doesn't always happen to me. It's when I, when I clean the house. After I've cleaned the house, the children know it's a museum. Nobody can walk in there for at least two hours, so I can just enjoy a clean home. I don't know if any other mums have experienced that. And when they walk in with a muddy foot, well, I'm not sure if I have that Eros love, but it comes back again um, when my husband cleans the house and fixes up the mess again. But it's just that wonderful love that you have for your partner. Then you get that Philos, friendship kind of love. We've all had a best friend at some stage. I have a best friend in South Africa. I've been friends with her since we were 14 and now we're 52. So we are friends for many, many years. Her and I have been through dramas in our lives. We've lost parents, we've lost loved ones, but we're still best friends. And we have that special bond that probably we'll have till we die because it's a lovely friend, a lovely friendship um, or philos love that we have. Then we have a store gay love, that deep affection love that we have, for example, for our children. I've got four children. I've got two humans and two fur dogs. They're my children, and I love my dogs as much, probably not as much as I love my children, but it's that affection, that possession. You belong to me. Now, my son is too much, too tall for me, aren't you, Jerry? So I can't put Jared in my lap. I often say to Jerry, 
can't you just go down a little bit? And I say to Amy, can't you just go down a little bit of science so I can put you in my lap and I can hold you and I can say you're mine? You know, it's that wonderful love of possession. At least my dogs are small. I can hold them and kiss them and, um, and they can jump out of my arms. But it's that lovely love of you know, their possession. I love you. You're mine. And then there comes that agape love, that ultimate in love, where you will sacrifice your love for somebody else. Like Christ sacrificed his life on the cross for us. Um, the disciples, except for John, all sacrificed their love for Jesus. Um, we have God sacrificing his love by giving his son to us to be born on this earth and walk on this earth. I would lay my life down for my children and for my husband and for God. We have that today in Iran, in Nigeria, many places in this world, many people we know in history that have laid down their lives for God. It's that ultimate love, that sacrificial love that we will do um, because it's that wonderful, sweet and most amazing love. Um, John Piper says um, the, he, that God's love is pure and divine. It paid the highest price, the life of God's own son on the cross. Now, I love children, as you know. I'm the children's pastor, and I love children. I love to hug them and kiss them. I think they think I'm crazy and I'm mad, but I just love children. And the children's international version um, puts 1 Corinthians I mean, sorry, 1 John 4, verse 16, in the most beautiful way. It says, we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. That is so beautiful. I, I even took a screenshot of it um, and put it on my computer so I can see it all the time. It's just a wonderful reminder and, you know, the famous um, verse, verses in Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8, we often has it at weddings. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always preserves. Love never fails. And I thought to myself, if you look at those verses, how many can you tick that you really live out well? Now, I'm an impatient person by nature. Um, so for me, patience is a, is, a, is a big thing to overcome. Is a kind, am I kind? Am I envious? Do I boast? Am I proud? Do I dishonor others? Am I self-seeking? Do I get angry? Do I keep a record of wrongs? Which I did. You know, every time my husband and I would have an argument, I would come out with the bad things. You know, like your whole record of wrongs, but we shouldn't be having anything like that. You know, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It protects, it trusts, and always hopes and preserves. And that really made me think, where am I failing? how much I really am dependent on God to change what isn't right in my life to what is right. Because we are an example of Christ, and we need to live out those things as well, the fruit of the Spirit. Um, I think we were married 20 years, Andres, or 25 years. He nearly died because I came out with an... I said to him, we have to write 20 things we like about each other. And my husband's very technical. So for him, it was an awesome an awesome task to think of 20 things that he liked about me. And I think I got to number 10 and I also started struggling. So now each year we add one on for each year. But it's a wonderful thing of going back and saying what you like and love about your partner. And Jesus commands his disciples to love one another as he has loved them. That attitude of loving each other as Christ loved us. How do we do that? And, you know, often um, as a mom, I have to wash the washing um, more often than the others. And my daughter has this beautiful new tendency of buying the most, ex well, not expensive, but buying these garments that really need care. You know, we normally at home put everything, because, you know, we have two men in our house, so things get sweaty under the armpits. 
So my children know that in our house, everything goes cotton, quick wash on 60 degrees. They don't know any other kind of way of washing. But now Amy has now gone and bought all these beautiful jumpers that are wool and they need garments of care. And so you have this long thing of how to, how to look after a garment. You need a magnifying glass to read it firstly, but it tells you how to look after this garment. And I have to wool wash it. You can't hang it up on the line. You've got to hang it up in the shade. You can't wash it on this wash. You can't wash it on that wash. And you, so it's, it actually makes life quite difficult on how to look after this garment. And when I was thinking about it, I actually thought to myself, well, God is the, is the carer of the garment. I'm the garment. He's the carer. But he doesn't need that long list of how to care for me. He just knows how to care for me. He's my shepherd. He's my carer. I don't, I'm that garment. I'm in his hands. Because if I don't, if, you know, when you wash a garment, it's reliant on you to put the detergent in, the wool wash, not the normal detergent. And you have to put the softener in so that, that the jersey doesn't come out all scratchy. So for me, God cares for me. I'm the garment. He's a carer. He knows just how to make it right. He just knows how to put that mix right in the, in when, he, when he washes me clean of all the things that I've done wrong. So you have love and you have joy, but you need peace to go with it, don't you? It's almost like a puzzle piece. You can't have one without the other. So for me and for Andres, our peace our peace is to see the sea. We love watching the sea. So what we'll do is we'll take a Tiger air flight, which is really cheap, so we can have a nicer place to stay so that we can get um, a view of the sea. And for me, just to have some peace to look at that sea, I just breathe in and I breathe out and I feel I can do life because I'm watching that sea. But the, Jesus, is the, God's the creator. He created that sea. He said, so my calm is in him. So you say to, oh, that's a nice illustration, you know, of peace and everything. But then the peace then lands up going a bit tricky, doesn't it? Because life gets in the way. Um, we have concerns, we have worries, um, we have stresses of the day, of work. We have stresses because we don't get on with somebody in the office. And so those things just come in big waves. No? So the calm sea becomes tidal waves. When I was a young girl in South Africa, I used to like swimming in the six-foot wave. I love, love body surfing. I was not scared of any wave. I think now as an older woman, I probably wouldn't surf them. But then the waves start coming to be tidal waves. And so the worry and the concern and the stress, they just the discontentment just comes flooding in. And so our perspective on Christ and our joy becomes really marred, doesn't it? We can't see that peace. We can't feel that peace. We can't have that joy because we're not focusing on Jesus. Anxiousness is preoccupying us. So we're spending more time on worrying and problem-solving that anxiousness and problem-solving that worry and being angry because we're worried and we're anxious and life's not going well, so our relationships aren't going well because we're just not a person in peace and in love. And I've had really some moments in life where I've had deaths, and in South Africa, I was pregnant with Amy at about seven months old, and driving in South Africa, I wasn't doing what the taxi driver wanted me to do, and in South Africa, we have, we call them taxi drivers because basically it's a minivan filled with at least, there should be taking 20 people in the van, there's about 50 people in that van. So I wasn't moving lanes the way he wanted me to move, to move, so he braked, he stopped, I braked, he climbed out, he had a gun, he came to the window, he said, I'll shoot you, if not, I'll cut your neck off. I'm going to kill you right there and then. And here I am carrying a precious cargo, my baby girl was in my, in the, and I just got a fright of my life. But God protected me because normally he would have shot me. That's his normal thing. But he just walked off and left me. And I drove home. But that anxiousness of almost losing my life was preoccupying me. And when I got home, I was shaking. And I remember the thing I did do was I said to the Lord, I really want to thank you for saving my life today. I just want to thank you for saving my life today. 
And in that way, I probably did worship God in a very, very different way. And I'm going to ask the kids, I'm going to stop the sermon right here, and I'm going to ask the kids to come in the front. So these are our children that come to the, to the English morning service. And we've got some children that went to the Cantonese. Guys, come right in the front. Come right up. Don't run away from me. Come right up. So we have some children that have gone into the Indonesian service and some children that have gone into the Cantonese service. And these are our precious children that have come to the morning service. So I want is an intrusion into God's providence. We just need to scoot. We just need to kick worry out. We need to kick anxiousness out. We need to kick concerns out. We need to say goodbye. We don't want you. Get out of here. That's basically what I say. I'm not the most patient driver. So I often have to say to Satan, get out of here, Lord, give me patience, because when I drive a car, I expect everybody to move out the way for me. <laughs> for me to get to A and to B, I really want it to be zero to 30 seconds. I don't like driving, and my husband's a very patient driver, and I often say, that lane, that lane, that lane, that lane, don't stay here, don't stay here, don't stay here. And I think I really saved maybe 30 seconds in the whole journey, but him being such a patient man, he just listens to me and he moves from lane to lane. But I need to say to myself, I need more patience, I need more love, I need more joy. So often when I'm driving, I'll say to the Lord, the fruit of the Spirit, self-control, help me here. I need some self-control. But, you know, Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of of the Holy Spirit. That is such a calming and good feeling when you're deep-rooted in Christ. Get rid of conflict, get rid of the wedge that's driving between you and God. I have highlighted Philippians 4 verse 6 because it's my go-to verse. I have different versions of the Bible at home because I study theology and I often use the different versions in my studies. Each Bible has this verse highlighted in a different color. Philippians 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Peace happens when anxiousness is taken away. It's absolutely re removed. The, the assurance that we are unconditionally loved by God a God we have an intimate relationship with, and a God where we have joy, love, and peace. Isn't that the best gift that we can have? That God is a God that loves us unconditionally, and that we can find love, joy, and peace in. I'm going to pray. And